Um, and this is a session where we're really excited to have working groups um, come back and give some report outs. And I don't want to waste any time, so I'm going to pass it over to Laura Bartolo from Northwestern and the MARTA Council, who is going to introduce our groups and mediate. Um, and we'll run some questions, and I'll put the link to the Google Sheet up. Take Great. it away, Laura. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And uh, thanks, everybody, for taking part in this session. Um, we have um, an important part um, with the working groups. These are really vibrant aspects of MARTA where um, the materials uh, community members lead an 18-month um, effort in focused areas, obviously, of interest in their research, but also uh, more importantly to the materials community at large. And we have five presentations, as you can see on the slide in front, and um, they'll give eight minute presentations um, and we'll have quest time for about 10 minutes of questions at the end. And David's gonna put the link for the um, Google sheet in there. Um, the uh, working groups are at different stages of their um, 18 month period. The first working group, um, uh, Metadata Extractors, they presented last year and now they're gonna be able to update for us um, what, uh, what they have been doing. Um, and then the remaining four are reporting for their first time. Um, the fourth uh, working group that you see there, Phase Field Metadata, um, this is a NIST initiated effort, and it brings in a large number of external collaborators as well. The remaining three working groups, LIMS, Microscopy, and Fair Train, um, they come out of oops, um, the FAIR Open Science um, Program and um, through the Materials Research Coordination Network or Martian, as we like to call it. Two of those working groups, limbs and microscopy, in addition to presenting today, will also be presenting at subsequent community meetings. Um, in March 15th at Northwestern, um, the Midwest Microscopy and Microanalysis Society um, will have them give draft recommendations uh, for each of those two working groups and gather feedback. And then um, subsequently in March, um, there will be a highlight article in the MRS bulletin by these two working groups. And again, they will lay out summaries of their draft recommendations and invite people to the 2024 MRS um, spring meeting where they'll be hosting a town hall. And then uh, finally, um, the uh, other uh, uh, FAIROS um, effort is FAIR Train. And that will be our final presentation. And um, we heard a number of people yesterday talk about the need for beginning scientists to learn about FAIR data principles. And um, FAIR Train will talk about their um, work in this area. So with that, I'm going to turn off my video and hand this over to Matthew Evans. Thank you, Laura. I think I am going someone to needs to stop sharing before I can share it. Perfect. Yes. Okay, so I believe I've got five minutes, so I'm probably gonna speak at a million miles an hour, uh, but hopefully I can get some of this across. So let me start a timer. Right, thank you very much for the, for the introduction. I, I'm going to talk about the, the metadata extractor interoperability for material science and chemistry working group that we've been running, uh, well, I guess, for a little over sort of 13, 14 months now. Uh, this, this work was sort of mostly led by myself and Peter Krauss at TU Berlin, but we had many, many people contributing, including David uh, Elbert, who's here with us today as well. Uh, so this was really quite a big team effort. Uh, yes, that's what I've just said. So. We sort of set out from discussions um, in Matthew, we are not seeing your slides, if there are. That up. is concerning. We've got you on camera. Let me try to reshare. I was seeing them. Oh. Yeah, I was seeing them. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. <laughs> reshare. Now you don't I need to see them. Now I see them. Everyone is seeing them now. Thank you. Okay, just shout if, if that goes wrong again. 
Uh, yeah, so just to, just to motivate the working group, we, we uh, set out from discussions, uh, I think, at previous MADA meetings and, and, and various other avenues uh, about communalizing the kind of work of scientific extract transform load. So the act of taking raw data from instruments or you know data just in files generally and turning it into something scientifically useful uh, by applying schemas uh, such that they're then suitable to be stored in databases and archives. So that's all the motivation you're going to get apart from these user stories where uh, you know you, you could imagine being a scientist wanting to deposit some raw data in an archive uh, on its own without any additional metadata. That isn't particularly helpful. Even with metadata, it's very useful to be able to describe uh, what the file is, how it could be passed, and what the output should roughly look like. Uh, this could then enable the, the archive servers themselves to have domain-specific sort of shims on top of that data. Uh, another user story would be focusing on the idea of a, an ELN or data management developer who wants to support a new file format. Um, you know, maybe a new uh, a vendor has changed their, their existing format or, or something like this. Uh, that's actually quite a lot of work to do, and, and we want to be able to uh, take these efforts worldwide and and you know allow different platforms to uh, to support as much data as possible. And then finally, you know, a lot of this kind of work on developing passes for proprietary formats and so on is is kind of a sort of thankless task. Um, so we hope that this working group could be a way of getting people's work out there and aiming to sort of foster communities and ecosystems around particular parser projects. Or I, every time I say parser, I pretend I'm also saying extractor, given that's the type we chose. So our approach for this was sort of threefold. Uh, First, we decided that we needed a, a lightweight metadata schema for describing uh, the actual extractor code that we, we develop and also the file types that they support. Uh, then as a sort of a, 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 stretch, a stretch secondary goal would be to come up with a common API specification for how to execute this code so that it could be done in a, in a machine actionable way. Uh, and finally, as a kind of uh, relatively straightforward fallback in case the working group fell apart, we wanted to create a searchable registry uh, of different extractor projects and file types uh, so that even if people weren't using the machinery from the other two aspects, uh, we would have that as a, as, a, as a sort of deliverable. And I guess I'm here to tell you that we did those three things to, to varying degrees. So there is a schema for file types and extractors. Uh, I'm not gonna sort of dwell too much on the, on the details uh, everything I've talked about already can be found through the Mater Alliance GitHub organization. It should be straightforward to find our repositories. Uh, but yeah, so the, the, the schema we ended up with for a file type, uh, you could think of it as just a way of, a, it's like a label or an anchor that extractors can say, you know, this is this is the file type I support. So it's fairly straightforward. So on the right here, you see, you know, we have a, a, a an ID and then some sort of optional descriptions, vendors, instruments, and, and the things that might be useful for searching. The extractor schema is actually quite a bit more complicated, as I'll show you in a second. Uh, this covers uh, a, a format for specifying the kind of file types you support, how to actually install the code, uh, how you execute the code, and also uh, things like licensing and bibliographic data. But importantly, we, we couldn't get to a point where we could nail down a way of providing output schemas for extractors just because it was uh, too sort of diverse uh, and, uh, and tricky a problem. So just uh, by way of showing you how complicated it is, I guess, this is the the, uh, the schema for an extractor. Um, so you can see lots of different things to consider. The second aspect is this registry. Uh, again, this registry exists. It is hosted at mada-registry.fly.dev if you want to check it out immediately. Using these schemas, uh, essentially via GitHub pull requests, people can submit uh, data that matches those schemas we, you know, we will then review it, it will be validated, and we can decide whether it's worth adding. So you, know, you can start seeing the list of file types we built up over the course of the year. Uh, there's quite a few more underneath this, uh, but still you know, we're looking definitely for, for contributions. So if you have uh, file types in particular you want support for, or you have your own extractor code you'd like to register, then please sort of reach out to us. Uh, and as I say, this kind of already fulfills, I would say, the, the, the fallback worst case of uh, of the working group, which is, you know, this this data set will now sort of live on no matter what happens next. So here's just an example of what an extractor in particular looks like for Peter's code, Yaduk. Uh, so you can see it supports many different file formats and we have a nice little dashboard showing, you know, how you would cite this code and how you go about getting it. And then the final part is this API for executing parser code. Um, again, we sort of just did this. So we have a, a proof of concept or, or reference implementation in Python for this. So it downloads data from the registry, 
let someone without any other dependencies at all uh, extract data from one of these supported formats. So you, know, you essentially have like a, a blank Python virtual environment. When you try and extract, in this case, an example MPR file, you have to tell us that it's a biologic MPR file as well, although we could start doing some detection on these, these file extensions. Uh, then essentially it looks up in the registry for supported extractors, finds the installation instructions, installs it in an isolated environment for you, uh, runs the actual extractor on your file, and then spits back the data into a uh, well, in, back into the original process. So if you're interested in, in sort of how that works, you know, happy to talk about that in the questions afterwards. So I think I'm fortunately I locked my phone so I couldn't see my timer anymore. I have gone well over, but I was interrupted. So I will just finish with what's next. Uh, we want to do 1.0 releases for all three of those projects. And this is a great time basically to try it out and give us feedback because things can still change. Uh, we need to do some things like finding permanent hosting going forward. Uh, and there's also quite a few remaining technical challenges that could form the basis of a new working group if someone would like to do that. Uh, in terms of sort of what's next directly, um, we've been hosting these fortnightly office hours. If people want help registering stuff into our registry, happy to continue with that. Just reach out to us. And yeah, hopefully some of this stuff will be then used in real world projects soon. So yeah, happy to take questions afterwards and thank you for listening. Thanks so sorry much. Sorry for overrunning, Laura. No, no, you did well. Um, good talk and uh, thanks so much. So next up is um, uh, is Josh Talon. So Josh, great. And take it away. You're seeing that and hearing me all right? Yep, I am. Perfect. We thanks so much, Laura. Uh, so good afternoon, good morning, wherever you are. Uh, glad to speak with you. Uh, my name is Josh Talon. I'm a research engineer at NIST. Uh, I work in the Office of Data and Informatics there uh, within the Material Measurement Lab. And I'm presenting here on behalf of uh, one of the uh, MARTA working groups that has, was recently, somewhat recently established uh, through the Martian effort that, that Laura was mentioning before. Uh, I'm presenting on behalf of my co-chair, uh, Eric Stock, uh, as well as all the working group members. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to uh, tell you what we've been up to. Uh, a standard disclaimer from NIST, not doing any of this, but uh, opinions are my own, not the government's. Uh, so this is just reviewing a little bit of what, uh, what Laura was showing before, but uh, our working group and then the uh, microscopy metadata working group, which you'll hear from, uh, I believe, right after me, uh, comes out of the, the Martian, uh, the, the Research Coordination Network, Materials Research Coordina Coordination Network uh, project, uh, which had goals to uh, bring the community together to develop metadata standards and shared tooling uh, to enable FAIR research, and also to connect the various efforts that are going on uh, between stakeholders in material science and engineering research to support national goals. Uh, so. Amongst other uh, seminars that have been held as part of this effort, uh, the two working groups were formed, uh, the microscopy metadata and then the LIMS working group, uh, which I am one of the co-chairs of. Uh, just going into a little bit more detail of our membership, um, because we're relatively new, this is our first time presenting at MARTA. Uh, our LIMS working group, uh, we tried to identify members that would bring together uh, experts from across the nation in material science and engineering uh, from all different uh, walks of life, so to speak. Uh, so from academia, government, and and industry, and including vendor participation as well uh, from uh, primarily microscopy uh, manufacturers. Uh, our primary aim is to make recommendations that will facilitate the use of limbs uh, throughout the materials research community uh, and try to make that process easier. So what what, taking a step back, uh, what do we mean by LIMS? This is a one slide, very brief introduction to LIMS. LIMS stands for Laboratory Information Management Systems. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with these already, but the idea is that uh, uh, LIMS is a, a resource or a collection of resources that will allow you to uh, collaborate, uh, enhance scientific integrity, and uh, maintain institutional knowledge uh, about your research environment uh, across a disparate amount of data resources that uh, come about in your laboratory. So it's really part of this key aspect of digitizing our research process and trying to make that process more uh, both easier for humans to, to query later on, but also more importantly, perhaps making it machine actionable, machine queryable, uh, able to you know, able to train artificial intelligence algorithms, all that. So some examples of things that having limbs enables is uh, managing sort of digital research workflows, uh, enabling 
data repository, so you have a place to store your data and find it later, uh, creating citable and uh, persistently identified data products, and then also allowing uh, for the organization of data, both at the published level, but at the working level too, uh, to be able to make it easier to find your data later on and make queries of your data in an intelligent manner. So our working group had a few goals. Uh, this is just a bl block of text, I apologize. But uh, first among these is to document the best practices that people are already using uh, for recording experimental metadata in materials analysis. There are a, a very number of approaches that are currently happening that we're aware of uh, in the community, and we want to uh, document those. We would like to foster awareness of existing schemas that are used by LIM systems for materials research. Uh, if any, we would like to identify key gaps that as a community we feel uh, currently exist within those schemas, and also in the way that metadata is recorded, whether that's uh, sort of by personally by a researcher or by instrumentation, uh, by, by the software that vendors provide, et cetera. And then we also would like to document how uh, the adoption and use of LIMS can benefit not only individuals in the research environment, but institutions more you know, more widely, and then at, at the largest level, the community as a whole, uh, by better recording our data and, and our metadata and being able to uh, share what we have recorded. So what we're aiming to deliver uh, as part of this is, uh, again, as I just mentioned, the documentation of the various capabilities that are that should be uh, included in a LIM system uh, if you are going to implement one, what are sort of the, the bare minimum capabilities that uh, you should have. Uh, a description of the value that's added by LIMS along with the costs that it, you or your organization might uh, incur by going about and implementing a system like this. Uh, and we want to do this from the perspective of various stakeholders. So again, from individual researchers, project leaders, uh, all the way to maybe facility managers, uh, a, a, an entire university, et cetera. Uh, we like to review uh, existing metadata practices in material science and cognitive disciplines. So really looking at what sort of metadata schemas are, are already out there and either make a re recommendation to use one as is or uh, a as an alternative, develop and publish our own extensible metadata schema that we believe is uh, most appropriate for the use in LIMS to support materials research and engineering. So our, our working group has sort of divvied ourselves up into three primary areas to accomplish uh, those goals and to deliver those deliverables, uh, depending on sort of the, the interests of our members at, at the start of the working group. Uh, these groups are working uh, quasi independently and periodically we meet back together to discuss amongst the entire working group. Uh, and then the outputs of each of these groups are going to be collected into our final set of recommendations. That's the, the approach that we've taken uh, for this group. So the uh, first one is this question of values and costs. So basically, what is it, what is it going to cost me or my organization uh, to implement a LIMS? But on the flip side, what do I get out of that process? What what sort of new capabilities do I have that I wouldn't have had uh, before beforehand? Uh, in terms of capabilities, we want to have a uh, an explicit listing of the sorts of both the prerequisites for implementing a limb. So you must have you know services X Y Z in place at at your institution or in your research group before having a limbs. But then also what capabilities would that LIMS provide? Uh, we found there was a lot of confusion and, and maybe disagreement you know, amongst the community about what all you know entails a LIMS system. And so by getting our group together and being able to uh, write that down and describe that, hopefully the, the community can come to a more consensus understanding there. And then the final technical work uh, of the group is more on this LIM schema side. So that is, can we recommend a minimal set of metadata uh, in, and hopefully a specific format uh, that we should be using in a LIMS system to enable basically making all of our data fair, right? Being able to interoperate with any other number of systems that are being developed. So our progress to date, I have 20 seconds. So uh, our progress to date is we have founded, we are here, we, we exist. Uh, we've had a few meetings, uh, both in person and virtual amongst the working groups and including meetings with instrument vendors. Uh, so we got kind of really got started in uh, May of, la of last year. Uh, we are currently right in the midst of our work, preparing our draft recommendations, uh, after which point we will be starting to gather feedback. And then we hope to publish our final recommendations uh, towards the end of uh, 2024. Uh, how to learn more, uh, we, 
I believe the plan is to eventually publish our uh, recommendations and any uh, sort of outputs on the MARTA Working Group's website. Uh, that's the hope. As Laura mentioned, we will be having this town hall at the spring MRS meeting. That's going to partially be our, our grand reveal, so to speak, of our preliminary recommendations, uh, where we would like to be able to gather some feedback from the community and, and really make this an iterative process. And then uh, we will be public publishing our final recommendations again towards the end of uh, 2024 in a, a venue to be determined, uh, but we have some thoughts on that already. So I think I'm out of time. So thank you, Laura. Thanks, so, okay, good. So um, I believe Ed Bernard is uh, up next and he is the um, microscopy working group. So Ed, if you want to use your, yep, good. Okay, everybody can see it? Yes. Great, hi, thanks, thanks Laura uh, for the introduction. Um, my name is Ed Barnard, I'm at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Lab at the Molecular Foundry. Uh, and our working group uh, kind of followed the same uh, trajectory as uh, as Josh mentioned with the LIMS group. Uh, and we actually met as a, as a group together uh, or, or intermediate uh, during this, this time to, to kind of connect because there are actually quite a bit of of overlap in what we're trying to do. Um, but we have a very specific thing to look at uh, microscopy data and, and dive into that uh, and looking at uh, trying to document and promoting fair electron microscopy data for material science. Um, and so what, what are our goals? Um, uh, we are trying to identify common languages to describe uh, microscopy conditions for material science electron and microscopy so that uh, we can uh, we can share information about, about the experiments that we did. Um, and so uh, our hope is to recommend specific metadata and microscopy conditions that should be included with data uh, to enable uh, reproducibility of material science electron microscopy, uh, along with fair data practices such that we can find this data, we can, we can, it's accessible, it can be uh, reused, all that, all that great stuff. Uh, we want to give recommendation about what that's going to be. Uh, and I think a really important part about this, because electron microscopists are built by, by companies and by vendors, we are really working to uh, in, encourage vendor support of these, uh, including these, uh, and, and including translators uh, for this, because I think that's going to uh, really build that, uh, the community of the, the people who make the microscopes and the people that use them. Um, and, and, and like Josh was saying, there's a lot of, uh, of work that we want to do on sharing these recommendations and knowledge, the best practices to the materials community. Um, so one of the, the pieces of this are the minimum standard metadata fields. First is like a core or, or that we're trying to, to make sure that's included. Uh, this doesn't necessarily just apply to microscopy, but it applies uh, to, uh, to uh, to ma many types of things that, that fit into that lim limbs work as well. Uh, who, what, where, and when, and we've identified uh, different standards that already exist. We don't want to uh, uh, ignore what's out there. We want to build from what we know and looking at the Dublin core. Uh, many people are aware of, 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 of the, of the DOIs, for example, because one very important thing that, that we realize is we need unique and persistent identifiers for for data, for samples, and scientists, and so uh, we we've looked into standards that exist, uh, DOI uh, for for documents, PIDINST for instruments, uh, ORCID for for scientists, uh, and I think the, the the big focus is also on microscopy conditions. How what metadata did we include? Uh, so stepping back, we we wanted to look at what the field was. Uh, uh, in many other fields. And so we looked at, for example, the open microscopy environment that's really focused on biological imaging. And so they have uh, file formats and metadata and naming conventions and standards. Um, for the uh, neutron X-ray scattering community, there's Nexus uh, that, that also has actually extensions for electron microscopy. And so we, we, we are, wanna be aware of what's there, what's there and what, what's, what works for mater the material science electron microscopy community and what doesn't. Uh, and, and I think one of the, the ones that we discovered by is that um, the Microscopy Society of America has actually de been developing a standard for a long time, the, uh, this uh, uh, hyperdimensional data, uh, data file format, or HMSA, uh, that's actually becoming an ISO standard. So 
So if there's already a standardization process, we, we don't want to ignore that. We want to actually lean into to the stuff that exists. Uh, and so here's an example of the, 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 the standard and uh, example document that exists. It's a well-defined format with ISO standardization. So it has a hundred page document that describes in very clear detail what things mean and what the, and, and how they should be structured. Uh, and so uh, uh, through this process, we've discovered that there are standards that we can uh, we can recommend. Um, but those standards, the standard, for example, doesn't necessarily tell you what needs to be included as far as the microscopy conditions of, of an instrument uh, in order for reproducibility, uh, for example. Uh, so to do that, this is where we're kind of diving into defining canonical uh, elect microscopy workflows for materials. Uh, and we realized that that um, there's been, a, for example, I, a work on cryo electron microscopy for biology, uh, but th those have different requirements from a hard material or a soft material in a materials co context. Uh, and so we were looking at different modalities um, that are, that really apply and different material classes like hard materials uh, or dose sensitive soft materials. And we want to define minimal uh, metadata requirements that enable both this reproducibility of, uh, of say an image uh, and the and the fair data standards. Uh, and I think one thing that we really realized is that if we just make up a list, it doesn't necessarily help anybody. We want to actually prove it to ourselves that this set of uh, metadata is useful. And we're, we're working to uh, on a demo project where we can send a sample between institutions, include the metadata about what we took and, and illustrate that reproducibility. Um, so here's an example of the, of the TEM, at least what we're thinking about right now, about what uh, needs to be there for us to be able to make, uh, like for example, a, a HADF image from, uh, from one um, instrument to another. I'm not going to go into the details, but that's that's kind of the the uh, uh, example of one list. Um, so I think just to reiterate, this this is a, important for community buy-in. We want this to be something that that people are actually will use. And so uh, part of this is our working group membership includes people from academic institutions, national labs, industry, NIST, uh, and the microscope vendors. Importantly, uh, and then we're working on the same kind of timeline that Josh mentioned about. Uh, outreach to the community, getting feedback. And then just as a uh, very brief uh, idea of what our recommendations are, we're, we're trying to uh, give people recommendations about what standards they should use about the user, the sample, the microscope conditions that we include, um, come up, uh, define a, a standard naming convention. We're, we're leaning towards this HMSA uh, using what's there. Uh, and then work with uh, with software or, or either vendors or open source things to extract these values into a multitude of uh, current data formats. And it sounds like other uh, working groups are already working on on the kind of the tools uh, that would enable that already. Um, that that that's kind of our quick overview of of what we've been up to. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Ed. If you want to take down your slide, we can get re ready for Daniel. You were right on time. Everybody's doing a great job. Daniel, um, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Laura. So uh, I am uh, Daniel Wheeler. I'm in the Material Science and Engineering Division at uh, NIST. Um, I'm a, basically a computer scientist uh, in, in, in the materials, I'm working in materials. Um, and so I've kind of really been interested in this topic for ages, actually, I, but never really had a forum to, to work on it. Um, so this is a, a, a great opportunity. I'm glad that like there's people that are also interested in this. So this, I guess the title of the talk could be phase field simulation metadata or um, phase field schema or, you know, this, so there's, there's different title, titles for the group that we could have, but basically, um, so we started uh, back in September. We, we At the moment, we're just having monthly meetings. Um, and a lot of it was about defining the scope. So we had a, you know, this is a massive scope. So you're defining, this could just also be simulation data, right? Simulation metadata uh, working group as well. We've chosen phase field. It doesn't have to be phase field. Um, but that's a convenient place to start in a sense. Um, and I think, 
more recently, we've got the ball rolling uh, and we're, we're getting more concrete about what we want to do. Um, yeah, so the uh, group members, so a number of these uh, 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 members come out of the phase field um, uh, working groups that we've had uh, um, at, at Chimad. Um, and they are interested, they're mostly like developers of phase field codes and practitioners as well. Um, so they're the main experts. Just recently, we've also had Michelle Selza and um, Hafiz Noman join us um, from KIT. And they are more into ontologies and they're giving some more of that sort of expertise. And obviously, Zach is very much you know, he has a, a, a good uh, background in that as well, in uh, the ontology side of things. Um, and Hafiz is doing his PhD in ontology development. So he, he's, uh, it's nice to have someone like that on board, but with the group. Uh, but we, uh, I, we could always have more members. So, uh, yeah. Um, at least from my perspective, there isn't a really good, like a semantic web standard for material simulation in general. Um, uh, there's parts, right? So you can think about the different parts of what would go into a, a, a semantic web standard for material simulation. Um, but there isn't, I would say there's nothing out there right now that we could just pick up and use. Um, and as I said, phase field is a convenient place to start for me. And uh, it's it's sort of in that you know it, it, it's meso scale between uh, the, the, the it's a it's a nice uh, material science convenient material science place to start and so I have a background sort of wrangling the data for the phase field benchmarks and producing plots for that and trying to get people to submit data for the phase field benchmarks in ways that we can digest and use and trying to automate that process. And that has proven to be very difficult, even for very kind of well-defined problems, it's difficult to get people to agree on, you know, what data formats to use and so on and so forth. Um, we also have a, for the, for the PFR project, we have a sort of an existing schema that is very simple and doesn't cover any of a lot of what we really need, uh, what we would like to have for that particular project. So that's kind of where my uh, motivation is coming from, and also some people in the group as well. Uh, so the sort of grand vision here is to have this metadata standard, base it on uh, existing semantic web technologies, um, and then so we've we've come up with some use cases, which I'll describe later, uh, and use this metadata standard with those use cases to show examples of using uh, um, using this sort of thing. Um, and then this could possibly provide a template for, for fair metadata standards for general simulation uh, as well. And also we could team up with uh, other groups working in, in similar areas um, at different length scales or for different problems. Um, especially in the, you know, in the realm of simulation. Uh, so we could call it a metadata standard. We could call what we're looking at a data dictionary, a semantic data dictionary, which is a step further than a data dictionary, you know, based on proper web semantics and, uh, or just a schema or an ontology. So these, I think we can use any one of those terms. I prefer, I think right now, semantic data dictionary to describe what we're aiming at. So the, what, what have we done thus far? Um, we have a proposal, which is a two-page proposal and a work plan uh, that is in the repository. We have come up with five use cases, and I'll describe that on the next slide. Um, we have a, a list of relevant literature, um, and we worked on a glossary with the help of ChatGPT to fill everything in. Um, and we're trying to expand that. And then we're also working on a loose hierarchy from that glossary. So there's a lot of things that are very obvious. There's other things that aren't. Um, and we also made tentative attempts at using schema.org. And uh, we're also working on with Datasite to kind of take this very loose hierarchy and give it some substance. Um, uh, the image on the right is just the uh, 
first page of the glossary that we're that we're working on. Um, so the use cases right now. So we have an AI use case. We have a, a, um, each one of these use cases is like a page or two page document with some context. It identifies key issues and then how these issues would impact the meta. Uh, 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 the metadata that we want to develop. So what in particular in the metadata do we need for these use cases? So AI is very different from if you're doing a research project data management, for example. So AI, you might want to label data and explain what the sample axis is or the feature axis, things like this, right? Which it's, you might not ordinarily do if you're saving your data. You wouldn't necessarily do that. Um, and the phase field benchmarks, that again is a very particular thing that we're interested in in that project. So what does the hierarchy look like right now? At the very top level, we have a phase field result. And we're thinking of dividing this into four sections, which would be a problem specification, uh, a computational execution or environment, the numerical solution, the sort of abstract uh, definition of a nu the numerical solution, and then the data set details. Now, some of those are really easy to deal with. Some of them are really difficult. So a problem specification, for example, is a very, very difficult problem. And it's probably something we will punt on. We will say, you know, keywords or, or, or you know, so there's like math ML, there's open, there's things that we can use to do that, but that might be beyond the scope of where we want to go. Certainly things like a data set details, for example, we can pull in an existing data dictionary style. Um, uh, and, and, you know, schema.org has a lot of these uh, uh, data set standards already uh, that we can possibly use. Uh, a numerical solution, for example, is not too difficult to define a, a, a schema for that. Um, computational execution, on the other hand, it would be more difficult. So our work plan right now, uh, we're going to continue with the monthly meetings, um, and we're working on completing this metadata hierarchy um, using the use cases, apply the standard that we come up with to these use cases, and that is what we plan to disseminate in the long run. Um, and the, the image on the right shows the sort of the way that we're going. We're starting with the list and going up that, you know, yeah, getting more, uh, creating uh, this glossary and then creating a hierarchy and so on. So if you're interested at all in simulation metadata, I would be great if, 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 you, if people would join the group. Um, we can certainly cope with more people. I think we can split the group out and work on different parts of the schema if necessary. Thanks. Thanks very much, Daniel. Right on time. And so if you want to take your screen, your uh, slides down, then Olga can put hers up. Great. We can see that, Olga. And um, you can now uh, take over the floor. Uh, thank you so much, Olga. Hi, Olga. Olga. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you for giving us opportunity to 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 show results of the the working group. So I start by uh, acknowledging all contributors to the working group. There were like seven of us uh, meeting over uh, three months, uh, and the document that resulted through those conversations can be found under Magda uh, Alliance GitHub uh, repository. So if you would like to see, just uh, uh, go to the to the link. So let, uh, let me start by motivating the, the, the scope. Uh, through the whole meeting, we've heard uh, multiple times need for infusing these fair principles into materials uh, uh, science engineering curriculum that is already difficult to squeeze in. So what could be the, the minimal effort that we could, uh, uh, we could do to, to expose students early in the, in the process of the education into fair principles? So as I said, we, we, we met uh, uh, five times over three, three months period. Uh, the scope was just to like define those 
modules, what those modules could be. We organized them into, into some groups, uh, groups of uh, activities that could be implemented uh, uh, into uh, teaching. So the goal was not to, to, uh, to uh, like figure out low level details, but just to think what those uh, uh, like small tasks could be. So uh, the more detailed uh, uh, motivation came from fairly fundamental mechanical testing, uh, which is tensile testing that uh, we believe could be a great uh, opportunity to expose students to fair principles. Um, most of us uh, in early age, uh, early uh, courses in curriculums uh, were exposed to tensile testing, like how to, many of us collected raw data as a, in the form of table, uh, were asked to plot uh, plot the, 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 the values and extract proper, properties with relationship to some uh, some standard. And this is great, uh, great uh, exercise, but what would it really take to make it really fair? So when uh, this idea of the tensile testing as a test case for fair came up, I asked the question, so maybe there is an ontology for the tensile test Tensile testing, and this is the paper from 2023 uh, by German a group who implemented ontology for uh, tensile testing. And what you, you we would like to see as a like a fair uh, fair data users is just the the, the data in form of graphs. Uh, but what we re where we are really now is like we are collecting the the Excel file. Uh, so I love this figure because it shows like how uh, how complicated even such a simple task as tensile testing can become if we want to make it fully fair. So you can see also standards, you can see uh, ontology development. There are lots of tools uh, that are like specialized. So how can we uh, expose students uh, uh, to those principles? Obviously, we cannot expect that like students will be able to implement any of, of, of those, but how can we take this relatively simple Simple uh, uh, data like table uh, and uh, and use it for uh, teaching fair principles. Uh, so the the motivation of the example came from my conversation with Brian Schuster, who who shared his experience uh, teaching a course uh, uh, in his institution, and we started really with the the set of tasks uh, that mo uh, that uh, later on led to to to, ma uh, to to longer document. But we started thinking about okay, we have this just one table. Like, uh, can we just use it to, to um, load the data, to ask students to load the data without any metadata so that they are like stimulated to ask the questions, what this column is, is it a force, is it a stress, like uh, before they, 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 they generate data, uh, the new data, or if they ask to publish the data in some form of repository or integrate the data, what Brian is uh, uh, doing uh, currently is asking students to, at the end of the the the, the uh, they um, uh, ex uh, uh, they um, exercises basically to switch uh, and like uh, basically start using someone else's data or someone else's code. Those codes are like, codes are really simple. Like how do you extract the slope from the from the from the curve? But I feel like th this is like a really low low entry uh, uh, point to expose students into like fair, fair principles. And we ended up with the list of modules that are grouped under like three uh, three categories like how can we reuse the data, how can we integrate the data, and once we go through those, how can we really generate fair data. So a uh, document is much longer. There are lots of useful resources that everyone like uh, uh, contributed, uh, but it's organized into levels. So level one is the easiest to, to, to think of. So in case of uh, tensile uh, test uh, data analysis, this could be just loading data from last year and visualizing using script rather than clicking into some uh, uh, program and generating the plot. Script for visualization can be a great way of uh, asking student to to deposit data, to do some ver versioning of the codes, uh, write notebook to capture the, the workflow. So this is really like a small task that can uh, be uh, uh, linked with the fair, fair principle. Moving forward, it can be like much more complicated up to like data scraping. I don't want to go through all those details. Like if you are interested, uh, definitely uh, uh, check the, 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 the link and the, the repository. We spend significant amount of time thinking what can be actually uh, uh, isolated into like M plus or M zero level. 
Uh, so what are the basic resources that people could use in terms of software carpentry? There's lots of uh, really nice uh, resources and on the uh, on the um, repository you will see there lots of links. Uh, and uh, module zero uh, is mostly about introducing students into uh, like different data formats, uh, into data representations. Those are just like terms for like practitioners to take their course and think about where this like fair principles could be could be implemented again lots of lots of resources the uh, i cut lo lots of text uh, uh, from, from the document uh, the document is heavy more on the terms in terms of like fair or like different data data processing techniques what we are currently thinking about is how can we uh, add more material science aspect into the module so uh, this will continue into the next uh, uh, working group where we will uh, try to implement and uh, some of those modules, because as I said, uh, the module zero is mostly collection of resources that people could use. And uh, the, the, the modules will be uh, tested on the workshop that we plan to organize in, in summer 2025. And if you are passionate and interested in like a fair uh, uh, training, please uh, 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 contact anyone at Marda or like me directly and I will be happy to 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 include you. Yesterday I had like an interesting co conversation already with the speakers and people were thinking about uh, some ideas here as well. So thank you. Thank you for your time. Great. Well done. All of you, Olga and every all of the speakers. Um, maybe if all of the speakers would um, put their screens on. Great. And can we Someone did a magic on that last one where they brought the speakers together so people could see them. Yes. Austin is doing that. Great. That'll be terrific. And so um, the Google Sheet has good um, questions on there, and I can read some out, but um, – oh, good uh, – keep adding some as well, too. We'll have – we have – a few minutes and what I'm gonna try and do is just um, get one for each of the groups. And Matthew, I see um, that uh, the first question is, is to your group and I'd like to add on to it a little bit. Um, do you advocate having biweekly office hours or how much work? Did the group stay broadly engaged that way? And um, I think uh, as, the, as the one working group that has been together for more than a year, you can really offer some um, some uh, advice, uh, some feedback to us as well, too, to the council. How was it in working on the working group, um, both in terms of what you were able to do what you couldn't do. Sure. I mean, I'll try and not be sort of too demotivating. In this. So I think, you know, it was a lot of work and engagement did drop off. That's naturally sort of to be expected. Um, to pick on some of the particular points, I think, you know, the, the, the biweekly office hours we had or fortnightly office hours, uh, we just used that as the time that primarily Peter and I would allocate to work on that ourselves. We would announce it, and if no one turned up, that's fine. We would just be, you know, we would already signed up for doing our work in that time. So I guess that just sort of comes with working in the open and trying to encourage people to come. Um, so in that case, it wasn't sort of extra work. Uh, GitHub discussions, at least initially, worked really well. Uh, it let people sort of think about things a bit more and, and contribute asynchronously. Um, it's quite hard to sort of, you know, we, we never tried to force a discussion. So, you know, we, we didn't want to keep using these things throughout the year. At, at some point, um, you have to just sort of focus on the people that are engaged and, and you know, roll with that. Um, but it was good to see some people sort of drop it, drop in for a while, drop out for a while, and then and then come back together for the, the sort of the final weeks. Um, and then, yeah, I think, you know, to your general point about advice, I mean, I, I, you know, I probably can't think of any sort of general advice off the top of my head beyond laying out the working group ideas in such a way that there's like a, a safe off-ramp. You're not sort of setting yourself up to doing like a five-year program on this because uh, it can be quite, uh, you know, quite quite intense otherwise. Uh, so yeah, in our case, you know, 
knowing that if the worst case scenario we, we could stop everything and just have the registry still going with these file types i think was was comforting in some sense um and yeah i, I don't know i think maybe you know we, we in our working group it was primarily the two of us doing the actual sort of implementation although we had lots of good discussions um i don't know what the right sort of the sweet spot is for a number of people to have involved very very actively uh, i would say probably at least two <laughs> one would have been a bit bit depressing um but i'm sure it could probably scale to sort of four or five people and and, and you'll get a lot more done that way i don't know if that answers your, your general question laura but no, oh, that's great. And thanks for that. Um, Josh, I see that there is a question as well, too, some disagreement between how some in the U.S. and some in Europe think of the boundaries between LIMS and electronic lab notebooks. Um, do you think that exact boundary is critical or different con uh, conceptions that can just coexist and provide functionally useful data? Yeah, that, that, that's a really great question. Um, at the core, I would say I lean more towards the latter interpretation that I think uh, if, if it is a way that you can collect useful data and will make your research more fair, then it doesn't really matter what we call it. What, what we call it, right? And and to some degree, I, I think it's a matter of perspective or scope, right? Like I I could envision an electronic lab notebook system being a part of a wider limb system, right? Because it provides some of the capabilities of what you might think in a limbs. But most ELNs, for instance, are not going to provide a repository like a large data file repository. So if that's not important to you, then yeah, maybe you can use your ELN effectively as a limbs, like if it, if it meets all of those. Uh, requirements that you have for for your for your research, um, so it, you know sometimes it's a distinction without a difference or however that phrase goes. Uh, you know you're doing the same sort of thing. Other times I could see an ELN being part of a broader system. I, I you know I think ELNs make it are, are often an easy point of entry for a lot of this sort of work, right? In terms of collecting metadata and then being able to discover a structure in that metadata or just collect that metadata in a structured manner to begin with. Um, and so they can be an important part. I wouldn't say that one is more important than the other or that they always replace one another. It's like they're slightly different things. One is maybe sometimes a part of the other. So that, that that's a kind of wish-washing answer, but that, that would be my perspective on where an ELN would fit in with limbs. Okay, great. That's good. And we're come closing in on uh, the end of our session. So I just wanted to throw um, a question out maybe for both Olga um, and Dan um, Wheeler to consider, and that is um, uh, community involvement. Um, so in both of your areas, um, how community efforts can um, extend and um, how they can um, participate in the work that you're doing. Dan, you were um, alluding to that towards the end of your presentation and um, Olga as well too. We can see already from this meeting that there are people who are interested in taking a more active role in these areas. So if the two of you could address those, then I think we can uh, close out our session. Uh, sure, I, I mean, like uh, the, there's uh, a lot of space for community involvement and I would welcome anyone who, who, who would like to share their, their own experiences. Something that uh, I, uh, I have a question to myself and I'm constantly looking for resources on fair train uh, or fair, uh, fair training in material science. There was a really nice workshop last year uh, done uh, that I think resources also shared in the in the GitHub uh, repository. So, if anyone would uh, would be aware of any any training that is currently done for fair in material science, I would more than welcome uh, feedback. So, uh, just uh, leave a note in Google Doc, uh, and uh, I will really appreciate that. Great. And Dan, I know you were talking about. Um... 
others who might want to collaborate um, with the phase field metadata. Would you like to add more about that? How people could? Well, I, I, I think it does come down to us producing something that people can get their teeth into and do something with, right? So I, I think the uh, we have to iterate quickly, basically. If, if we want to create any interest, it's up to us to uh, iterate at a pace where we can get that feedback. Uh, and then, you know, that's how you get people, I think, excited by things. Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, uh, for, for me, so we have to create something, uh, show an example, and then iterate on that example. And it doesn't have to be perfect. We have to sort of fly by the seat of our pants a little bit. You know, we're not ontology experts or any of this type, you know, we have some, but so it will be highly imperfect, our first iteration, but we need, that will create, I think, interest. Um, so I think that, you know, that, so we have that, that that's the driver, I think, um, uh, from my perspective. 